Good evening, everyone. I'm George Micros, and I welcome you to the webinar Digital Humanities in the MENA region. It's my pleasure to host this event as part of the six-part webinar series organized by the Middle Eastern Studies Department of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Hammam bin Khalifa University. Digital Humanities is a growing and exciting field of study that combines data and theories from the traditional humanities and methods and technologies from the computational sciences, bringing the best of both worlds. Since the beginning of the digital humanities era, we have witnessed a rapid growth of the field and an expansion of both application fields and the methodological toolbooks used. Currently, machine learning is leading the technological innovations and gives us new ways to revisit old data. Using AI-enhanced research, we can form new ideas about the role of traditional humanities fields and offer novel explanatory models for them. The MENA region, on the other hand, is a place with a long history, rich tradition, and enormous cultural wealth and diversity. It's the place where history, religion, literature, music, politics, and sciences come together to form a unique cultural continuum. Digital humanities in the MENA region is an emerging field of research and development that combines the digital modeling of the rich cultural space of the Arab world and the application of novel computational methods to the understanding of how cultural phenomena interact with social structures. I'm really excited today. We're hosting a panel of international experts in various fields of digital humanities. I would like to thank them all for accepting our invitation to present their research in our webinar. And before we begin, let me remind you that you can send your questions using the field in the form of your screen. Since our presentations are quite diverse, please send me your, question, your questions for each speaker separately. We will have a questions and answers session right after the end of each presentation, and I really hope we can have an interesting discussion of the presented talks. Please allow me to introduce you uh, our first speaker, Dr. Fotios Fitzilis. Dr. Fitzilis has an academic background in law, economics, and engineering. He has been active in various fields from telecommunication and logistics to management and governance. Since 2008, he works in the Hellenic Parliament, specializing in legal informatics and the digital transformation of representative institutions. Dr. Fitzilis has been a visiting professor at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid in Spain and lectures at the National School of Public Administration and Local Government in Greece. In 2017, he founded the Hellenic OCR team, a crowdsourcing initiative for the study of parliamentary data. He's the author of more than 30 scientific publications, including three monographs. His latest book is titled Imposing Regulations on Advanced Algorithms. Dr. Fitzilis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Mikros, uh, my fellow panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen across the world. It is uh, my tremendous pleasure to join this webinar. And I hope and I look forward to a, a, a very fruitful discussion. Let me try now to share my presentation. I hope you can all hear that. Uh, you can all see that now. The presentation is titled uh, Digital Transformation of Middle East Administrations. And it will follow the, the, um, a very distinct structure. I will begin with a brief motivation. Why are we doing this research? I will present in brief our approach, followed by methods and tools that will help us uh, uh, realize this approach, and I will conclude with challenges uh, regarding this research uh, and brief recommendations uh, as uh, as follow up. Now, we all know that the Middle East is the actual birthplace of bureaucracy, since in the Middle East the first modern or ancient states were born they needed to be go uh, governed. And naturally, the uh, dominant institution of governance is bureaucracy itself. 
Now, what we are experiencing in the past decades, and particularly in the, in the current one, is that novel technologies and algorithms are disrupting traditional forms of governance and bureaucracy itself. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, being named uh, digital transformation. And uh, the question is, how can digital transformation reform traditional bureaucracies? Can it uh, transform them at all? And if it can, will this transformation change be sustainable? Will it go on forever? Or will we need to make every now and then some, uh, some additional steps to, to help it forward? Now, when we are talking about digital transformation, we are not only talking about changing the technologies and the methodological tools that bureaucracies use, computers, applications, services, and so on. We also talk about an adjustment of internal processes because if you think of it closer, it makes no uh, sense at all simply to introduce new tools and technologies and leave the, the old processes as they are. Uh, so this goes hand in hand, change in technology and at the same time change in the internal processes that administrations use. Now the big change in this sense that came in the last um, maybe 10 years uh, that was developed in the, in the last decade was the perception that the administration technically uses and, uh, and pushes forward or, or, or uh, communicates documents. And these have a very certain structure and a very certain content. They, we will name it for, for this uh, presentation legal documents. Now, the turning point into, um, into research came when people thought, well, we need to transform these documents into open legal data. We need to handle administrative documents as data uh, themselves. And in order for this data to be exchangeable, we, to be understandable by computers, we speak there of machine consumable data, in order to be able to be um, communicated across the world throughout various devices and from mobile to desktop uh, devices, we need to give them, to form them with linked open data format, formats. Now, if, you, if we try to do that, and if we create documents according to these kind of formats I will explain later, then we, ha we will have made a huge step forward towards Web 3.0 and the semantic web, the web that understands its content. But while we are doing this, we need to be very careful since in, a, uh, in Middle East, uh, is formed by numerous uh, um, states and it forms uh, a, a pretty much unique, as Professor Mikros uh, already mentioned, uh, universum within the world. We don't want this uh, transformation to happen exclusively with uh, uh, outsourced experience and technology. What we need to do here is to find the proper balance between international expertise and domestic expertise. We need to involve the dynamic domestic stakeholders and uh, Qatar, espe Qatar especially has a very dynamic young uh, group of people that uh, uh, are able to handle these new technologies. And 
here we don't need only to ask them whether they they would be interested into taking into um, having this kind of services of administrative services we need to involve them into building such services now having done and said all this what are the actual technologies that are behind this uh, shift paradigms shift in legal informatics what we have now in our hands that we didn't have maybe 15 to 20 years ago is a very unique set of standards that uh, uh, are universal and i'm not only talking about xml which is more than 20 year, years in place i'm talking about rdf which is essentially linked data all and something that came just two, two, um, two years ago we have a specific standard called a common tosho for the markup of legal documents so we have a specific language format where we can with which we can structure our administrative documents so, so that they can be understood from other machines from other users from other systems in qatar across the arab world and across the globe and what we have also in place is uh, uh, a notion of how we will handle this kind of information how we will build the uh, workflow management systems that will be needed in order to make these systems interoperable in order to understand each other and what we will need and we start doing research right now on that with uh, uh, within my team the hellenic ocr team is web-based collaborative and secure authoring tools tools where administrators public servants can draft these data these um, legal documents and uh, uh, so that they are uh, formed exported as uh, linked data and when we have all this the actual fun begins because then we will we will have the administrative workload as uh, as open data available and on that we can base a whole eco ecosystem of uh, analytics we can do textual analysis there uh, we can do artificial intelligence enhanced processing of the material that we have at our disposal so that we can build better services uh, assist our citizens even stronger in the uh, in in their um, uh, needs uh, and at the end make the whole governance ecosystem more efficient and more effective challenges now when it comes to open data production we can all understand that it can be work intensive because ad uh, administrations are used to to operate uh, in a certain way uh, you need uh, one needs to uh, uh, apply uh, a lot of energy to make administrations work differently and this puts additional pressure on it this does not work well with generally scarce resources that uh, administrations have at their disposal and do not forget please that there is always uh, immense resistance to change when it comes uh, uh, to uh, to public administration when uh, and when referring to uh, new technologies i have spoken of uh, of certain standards and methods that are standardized there are even more new technologies and tools that are not standardized yet so again the uh, research teams need to find a proper balance on which technologies and tools they will uh, utilize in order to form these new structures and services and i will conclude with the following um, administrations 
in general, have two basic options here. One is natural evolution. So uh, Middle East uh, administrations and North African administrations will have the option to do nothing and simply wait uh, to see things evolve as they as administrations have always done before. This is nothing, there's nothing wrong with this approach. Or administrations can select, can opt to have a more aggressive approach. We are talking here about a more disruptive approach. Skip certain innovation steps and go right to the state of the art. AI assisted uh, innovation. Is this maybe a thing for the uh, Qatari uh, national, national uh, research proposal cluster? Uh, actually, we think it is, and um, my team uh, has joined the, uh, um, the Hamad bin Khalifa University with a proposal for a digital transformation of selected public entities in Qatar. We hope we will have success in this. And what is most important, it's, it's, um, it's very bad, I will use this, this uh, non-scientific term, to take new technologies or to form new, uh, new tools and services and embed it within public administration, administrations that are not used in, in, uh, in using them or they have not participated in their development. So a very big point here is uh, one has to try to re-educate public administrators, the public officials um, as well. And if, uh, if one goes one step farther, one need, needs to involve them in, in the making of these new tools and services. And after all, if everything is done right, there is a vision that we can uh, now, uh, a future vision that it's not very far away, uh, maybe, maybe uh, in my eyes, uh, maybe half a decade uh, in front of us, we speak uh, after transforming the uh, uh, public service uh, ecosystem, we speak of a new, e of a novel ecosystem of linked open governance data and services that will be uh, accessible through all citizens, wherever they are, through their mobile devices or desktop devices, uh, so that they can um, uh, access the public uh, services for free and uh, and for uh, for anything they 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 might be used, they um, so uh, uh, thank you for this uh, for this and I'm uh, Professor Mikros. I am at your disposal and at the disposal of our uh, um, uh, audience for any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald. Uh, thank you. It was very very interesting and. Uh, I think uh, legal informatics is one of the fields that uh, digital humanities actually uh, can embrace and uh, can use uh, for various uh, approaches. Um, I have one question for you, and this is, I would say, more fundamental. Um, so uh, my question is, do you see that uh, all these processes, uh, all these technologies applied to legal documents, uh, how do you see um, uh, being used and how they can uh, help uh, political systems function in a more transparent way. Because these days we need transparency in political systems and political functions. Uh, can you see that? Can you see how these technologies, uh, especially legal informatics, can help to this direction? Thank you. This is an excellent question. Um, let me try to answer this uh, uh, This this question by giving an example. Uh, having this, the mentioned ecosystem of linked data and services, imagine the following. Imagine uh, government as the highest institution of all, a ministry, for instance, uh, issuing a law or a decree. Uh, this decree will uh, go into public administration, into with, the, with this specific legal, open legal form, 
uh, and public administration and its entities will start implementing it. So the the government, the central governance, will immediate have immediately have a clear picture on how and real time picture on how this law or decision is being implemented. If you go one step further, this uh, new law or or decision will have legal results and uh, it some some of these results so, uh, some of the provisions may be broken and people will go to court to to settle these differences with the state or between them so the state and the judiciary will immediately know in real time how this uh, decision or law is performing which which are the problems um, why do people go to court? Which provisions are are more frequently broken or used? So, in a second um, uh, step, uh, the the central government might want to change the law based on this feedback loop. But in this time, the loop will be one hundred percent accurate because it will be based on actual data and not assumptions. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. I have another question for you from our audience. So uh, there have been several renowned cases of failure in IT transformation of public services. Uh, how much faith do you believe that we can place in technical IT propositions for, for transformation? Uh, most of the times they overpromise and under deliver. This so there's, is a, a, there's, a, there's a crisis of reliability, of course. This is a common issue, and uh, not only in the MENA uh, region, I would say across the world, um, IT experts uh, turn, uh, uh, as it, as it turned, uh, usually turned out to be, um, promise too much, and on the other side, policy uh, expects too much. So the central, uh, this is what, what has changed now, uh, the question is uh, actually, uh, what uh, has anything changed now to uh, to to make this system work better? Uh, I would say yes, because um, in the new perspective, the novel perspective of how systems and services are built uh, are based on the collaboration between policy side and uh, and uh, delivery side, which is the IT sector, and at this intersection. The user requirements play um, have a central role. So, with the decades of, of software development, we have learned that we have to to, uh, to place special. Um, uh, 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 we, we need to, to to look at the requirements of the users very closely, and exactly this is what I mentioned um, uh, at, uh, at last. We need to involve public administrators more closely in the development of such systems. Because if you don't do that, you will deliver state of the art material and tools that won't be able to, uh, to be uh, implemented by the ones that care most, by the, the administrators themselves. So the critical point here is the trilateral cooperation between IT experts, policy side and uh, the users which are which is in our in our specific case uh, the public administrators excellent excellent thank you so much uh, thank you for this wonderful talk and uh, we will uh, go and proceed to our next uh, speaker and uh, our next talk is uh, going to be co-presented by Dr. Jen Snyder and Dr. Tanvira Lam. Uh, Dr. Jen Snyder is an assistant professor at the College of Science and Engineering at Hamad bin Khalifa University. He has received his PhD in computer science from the Technical University of Munich in Germany in 2009. And his research interests include interactive large-scale scientific and data visualizations hierarchical and level of detail algorithms. Dr. Tanvira Lam is an assistant professor at the College of Science and Engineering 
of Hamad bin Khalifa University. And he also uh, has a lot of research work on the transcription uh, regulation of non-coding RNA and their role in different diseases. His research work uh, also centered around the application of AI on the diagnosis and prognosis of communicable and non-communicable diseases. His research area also focused on application of AI in the field of humanities and social sciences. He's a member of Phantom Consortium. Uh, he has served as a reviewer in a number of international conferences and reputed uh, journals. Dear colleagues, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think uh, I go first. Um, hello, everybody. In this talk, we want to give you an overview of some of the research that we're doing at the College of Science and Engineering here. And uh, I'm going to briefly present a visualization toolkit that uh, deals with the visual exploration of chains of narrators in the Hadith. And if you're familiar with the Hadith, then you know that there's uh, six books that are considered a canon. And we are focusing on the uh, Zahir al-Bukhari with uh, a total of uh, over 7,000 uh, narrations before you merge uh, duplicates and uh, uh, narrations that have multiple chains. And what makes uh, these hadith as a data source so special is that we have 98 books and they are organized by uh, topic and they are carefully and meticulously um, edited and um, assessed for their uh, strength. And if we just start plotting the authors, then we see already that certain authors take out uh, the top uh, prominent uh, not authors, sorry, narrators stick out. The top uh, narrator that is involved in the tradition of most hadith is Asuri. And now we can ask questions, um, what else is in the data? So we find 65 geolocations, and you notice here there's many spelling variations in the text, uh, Al-Kufa, Kufa, uh, Al-Baghdad. So we manually cleaned them up and we ended up with around uh, 65 geolocations. And they can include cities, towns, regions, countries, provinces, rivers. Um, and uh, for us now, the challenge is to pinpoint the location of the individual narrators. Another challenge stems from the fact that um, these were collected by uh, Al-Bukhari. And here you see the full name. And as you may guess, it's very clear that all these uh, variations of namings, uh, patronymics and nicknames removed is very clear for humans that this is the same person, but not so much for computers. And therefore, we were fairly happy when we uh, found a data set um, where scholars actively uh, try to clean up this data and put this into a digital form. And this um, avoided that we had to do all the curation um, uh, individually. And also they assigned to each narrator an ID. And as computer scientists or informatics people, we like working with clear numbers because then we have the unique ID of each uh, of these narrators. So what else is in the data? We have a short bio, um, including sometimes lifespans and locations for the narrators. We have a link to the Muslim Scholars database that has the primary sources online. Um, and we have a generation. And uh, this generation led us to the visualization that I will show you in a little bit. And it's online, so you can play around with it as well. And then we have the uh, chain of the narrators. Um, and uh, the body um, where we have both Arabic with and without Tashkil and the English uh, uh, translation. Now, in order to uh, access this data, um, I started back in 2009 to write a a uh, Python package that exposes the data to a broader community, only to learn uh, much later that also a version is available as a Kaggle competition. So it's a very interesting and very culturally significant data that is at our fingertips right now. 
So this is a view of the um, visualization that we have come up with. And uh, you can go to this uh, web page as well. I will give you a QR tag later. So get your cell phones ready to capture this from the screen. Um, in the uh, innermost ring, this is the first generation after the prophet, uh, peace be upon him. And from there, we can click on these nodes that represent the narrators. And whenever we click on a node, then you see inwards segments means that the teachers here, they have narrated to the student. And so these, you see the influences of Asuri, who still was in contact with the uh, companions of the prophet. And the size of the node really tells you uh, how many uh, hadith went through this person. And the thicker these edges are, the more hadith also went through this person. On top of that, we have a location map here that you can uh, open and you see where this person has lived. And we have a list of the hadith in, um, that was narrated uh, by this person. However, this is still under development. So we only have right now the first three chapters. So this is the tip of the iceberg uh, at the moment. And you can click here as well and get the additional information and get the English and the and the uh, Arabic text. And we really see this tool as a way to explore these um, narrations in a non-linear fashion, the same way you have on a web page. But this here is uh, bringing more of the history uh, together. And um, for instance, we have the locations and we see that uh, the companions, they are centered in Mecca and Medina. Then later during the expansion, we see more people moving into uh, Kufa and Basra, later on Wasit. And as time progresses and uh, the new faith spreads, we see that people then move into, uh, into further and further regions. And so bringing back together the, uh, not only the religious aspect, but only also the cultural aspect is what drove us to this project. So here you see the period one is the blue, uh, a bar and you see Makan Medina gets uh, less significant with time, whereas Kufa and Basra pick up and Baghdad later as the traditional centers of, of knowledge shifted uh, through the region. Um, this here is a particularly interesting uh, visualization that Dr. Alam did um, and he will be presenting uh, this work as well at a conference that you can register for free soon, uh, 5th to 7th November. This shows the uh, sub-communities, the cluster, because now we have this network, the social network graph, and we can use all the analytics tools that we have at our disposal as modern data scientists to analyze and look into this data. So here's the uh, QR code that I promised This will bring you to the web page. Try to play around a little bit with it. Um, if you click on the notes, uh, things will happen and you will see how this works. With that, thank you very much. And I hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Tanvir, who will talk about another related project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Tanvir. We can hear you. Uh, yes, thank you, Professor Mikros. I believe you can see my screen. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Snyder, for a wonderful presentation on the Hadith. I'll work, uh, okay, so I'll continue on a similar uh, data that we have worked uh, on recently. It's an old topic of authorship discrimination uh, framework. And uh, we, based on the framework, we confirmed that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Islam, the Prophet of Islam, was not the author of the Quran. So I hope you will uh, uh, enjoy uh, this work. So just to give you a brief introduction about the authorship discrimination task, uh, this is a fascinating task under the realm of natural language processing or NLP, which try to identify whether the writings are authored by the same person or not. Um, 
considering different types of information, right? Uh, like the inet writing style or other lexical, lex lexical features, etc. And this fascinates us when the research work on authorship discrimination reveals that Robert Galbraith, um, the mysterious author of the Cuckoo's Calling uh, novel, was none other than J.K. Rowling, the famous author of Harry Potter series. So this is an example of the authorship discrimination task. Also, we know the famous dispute between Paul and Mark Zuckerberg back 2010, when Paul revealed some questionable emails from Zuckerberg and claimed the ownership of the Facebook um, back 2011, sometimes uh, later, then through the authorship discrimination task, it was proved that Mark was not the author of those emails. These two in instances clearly indicates the importance of the authorship discrimination task in, uh, in, in multiple fields, including the digital humanities, forensic linguistics, and other fields as well. So recently, we worked on this uh, authorship discrimination task, and we proposed a novel deep learning based architecture. And the prior works uh, on the uh, authorship discrimination task mainly based on the lexical, lexical features, which rely on the type of data. But here in this framework, we, we propose a, a context uh, corpus specificity free model, which can do the authorship discrimination task. It is a multi-stage deep learning based framework, uh, which consists of the CNN, BLSTM, and also the attention mechanisms. In the first stage, we, we develop a network, we called it AGRI network, which, uh, which considered the label data and try to understand the innate writing style from the label data and create a kind of authorship filter to, to distinguish the authorship style. Then in the following stage, we called it disagree network, which used these authorship filter created in the first stage. And then it considers a new data set to differentiate the authorships uh, of the new data set, which was injected in the second layer, uh, second stage of this multi stage deep learning based network. Then we check the performance of the model. And from the performance of the model, we check when we see the accuracy of the model on the actual data set on varieties of data set like uh, Reuters C15, which is a famous data set containing more than 50 writers. Also the spooky authors, we had three authors and, uh, and the literatures. And we check the performance also on the dummy data. Dummy data means we sh shuffled the author names on the original data set to produce the uh, dummy data set. And the performance, the difference of the accuracy clearly indicates that our purpose framework A2D was learning uh, the authorship style and it was able to distinguish uh, the authors. Then we applied our framework A2D on two different case study. In the first case study, we tried to unmask the pseudonyms of Washington Irving, the famous American short story writer used to write novel and writings using pseudonyms. Here I accept some example of sketchbook, also the history of New York. He used to write using different pseudonyms. And we asked our framework, can you distinguish whether these two novels are coming from the same author or not? And A2D proposed that it, it is generating a very similar attention distribution, which clearly indicates that these uh, two books or novels were authored by the same author, but using a different pseudonyms. As part of second case study, we've asked the A2D framework, did the Prophet of Islam, author of the Holy Quran? You know, the Quran is the holy book, and uh, in the Muslim world, it is considered the word of Allah, which was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam. 
and Prophet was only the conveyor of the Quran. On the other hand, Hadith is the recorded words, actions, and also the tacit approval of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So the authorship or the origin of a Quran is a topic of research in theology for a long time. According to the Muslim beliefs, the words of Allah is Holy Quran, and words of Prophet are the Hadith, and Prophet was just near the conveyor of the Holy Quran. Then we asked our A to D framework, can you detect whether these two holy sources are holy books are coming from the same author, same source or not? Interestingly, if you look at the graph, which shows the attention score from Holy Quran and Prophet's Hadith, which clearly shows that the attention score from A to D network was significantly different, which clearly shows that the Prophet of Islam was just a conveyor of the Quran. He was not the author of the Quran. Rather, it was the word of uh, uh, God Allah. So which clearly um, shows that the framework A to D in a perfect alignment with the belief of more than 1.8 billion Muslims around the globe. And in conclusion, we propose A to D framework, which can be used as a baseline for any kind of future authorship discrimination task. And we are planning to use this framework to differentiate all ancient writings from un un unknown authors as well. So here's the link of the paper, which has recently been published. So uh, if you are interested, just um, drop us an email. We, we can collaborate and other things. Now, yeah, if the audience have any question, we would like to take uh, questions from you, me and Dr. Snyder as well. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alan, Dr. Snyder. Very interesting, fascinating research. Uh, it's also part of my research focus. So I'm really interested in uh, uh, learning more about your method. Um, I, I can start, my, my, I can have a question myself. So- um, I'm not uh, you are an expert, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so just wondering, uh, this uh, method, uh, is it uh, tailored for uh, closed class classification problems or open class? I mean, can we use it uh, when we have a closed set of candidate authors or we can use it also in author verification in in problems where the the real author can be outside of our training data exactly it's a wonderful question and it, actually it was uh, one of the questions asked by the reviewer as well and we, we <laughs> explain it in details yeah it works independent of the uh, authors whether the author was in the training set or not because we, if you look at the presentation, if you remember, we, we used multi-stage uh, deep learning based framework. In the first stage, we used the C50 uh, data set, we, you, you know, the, and the more than, yeah, around 50 authors. And we tried to understand the innate writing style from varieties of writer, 50 writers. Then in the second stage, which we call the disagree network, we inject any, any kind of data, whether it was, part of the training or it, it may not be part of the training. So it is independent of the label data set to answer your question in line. So yes, yes, excellent, excellent. And uh, I'm pretty sure you can uh, test this method to, to a, long, uh, a large uh, range of data data sets and also in uh, open contests like the, the PAN contest in CLEF because they're having a lot of, of data sets there and you could test this uh, method. I don't know if, if you have already uh, uh, state-of-the-art results in these competitions. Uh, we are not part of the competition yet, but it is in our mind, yes. And we are planning to do that. Great, great, excellent. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, uh, and, and then another question for Dr. Snyder, uh, if, uh, uh, I may, uh, Dr. Snyder, uh, I, I was lucky enough to see the, the, the presentation in, in Kitcom, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. and it was amazing and uh, this interaction uh, really puts you inside the, the, the text. And while I, while I was looking at this presentation, I thought, uh, how about doing that in, in augmented reality? Have you thought about that? Nav yeah. Navigating inside the, the text. Yeah, so we don't have this in a augmented reality, but in a virtual reality. So okay. where you go in a, a head mounted display and you get full stereoscopic view and you're in a virtual environment and uh, you see 
this uh, wheel, the concentric rings in front of you on your left side is a globe where you see the locations on the right side is the text. It's a little bit difficult to navigate in, uh, in comparison to a screen, but we have the feeling that it's much more engaging, especially we had a lot of attention from uh, small children. So they were very, very interested in trying this out and seeing this in 3D. This yeah. is fantastic because you can uh, you can really see the text with a different angle and actually you can explore text and maybe conceptualize things inside the text using these different points of view. And uh, it's amazing. I'm looking forward for the, the development of your research uh, the days to come. Okay, thank you so much uh, for presenting your research. And uh, let me uh, introduce our next speaker which is already has been mentioned by your uh, uh, presentation. So our next picture, speaker is Dr. Patrick Iola. And Dr. Iola is an international recognized researcher in stylometrics and authorship attribution. He is the organizer of uh, the first uh, competition in authorship attribution called Ad Hoc Authorship Attribution Contest. And he is, of course, a member of all the the, um, the well-known public attribution competitions. Uh, he is the primary author and designer of the Java Graphical Authorship Attribution Program, JGAP, a very well-known uh, program in authorship attribution studies. And also, I would say, best known for his identification of J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter series, as the author of Robert Galbraith's uh, book uh, with the title The Cocos Calling. In addition to his research and development work, he is also active consultant in forensic authorship analysis, having testified in numerous cases. Dr. Yola has also taken lead roles in the development of standards of practice for computational and forensic linguistics. And since 1998, he's been on the faculty of Duquesne University at, Pitt, at Pittsburgh, uh, United States, where he currently holds the Joseph Lauriti Chair of Teaching and Technology. Dr. Yola, welcome, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes, okay, you can see that. All right, uh, let me start by saying salamu alaikum and apologizing that I don't have more Arabic. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking about what Arabic and English have in common from a perspective of authorship attribution. Um, now, uh, following um, uh, Dr. Katanvir's excellent presentation, I don't need to talk that much about what authorship attribution is. It's a classic problem in scholarship, such as determining whether the Quran and the Hadith were written by the same pers person. It's also got applications in forensics, such as figuring out whether or not the defendant wrote the ransom note, or in historical scholarship. Uh, the basic question is, given a document, who wrote it? Or if you can't tell me that, tell me something about it. Was it written by a man? Was it written by somebody whose native language was English? Was it written by somebody whose native language was Arabic? And if so, are we talking about Tunisian Arabic or Qatari Arabic or Syrian Arabic? It's an increasing area with a substantial body of work. And the basic assumption is that every author has a conscious or unconscious first personal fingerprint of expression. So everyone can try to do the same things. Everyone can try to same, say the same, same things, but they can't be the same. And some researchers, such as Hans von Haltren, have termed this the stylome. It's like the genetics of style. How to find the authors? Well, you get some training documents and you get some testing documents. You identify author specific features and you apply machine learning techniques. Um, I did not actually mention convolutional neural networks in this slide, but I should have given Dr. Tanvir's presentation. Now, you want the known documents to match the question documents as closely as possible because otherwise you're going to have problems that are caused by genre, tone, date, subject, all these things like that. Now I want the I want the close match. I also want a unicorn that flies and grants wishes. As long as I'm asking for things, I might as well ask for big things. 
and they're all equally likely that you get. I can't match a suicide note because generally people don't write more than one suicide note. That is a very underrepresented genre, especially on a per person basis. But I also can't match documents across languages. We can talk about how we can talk about the features lining up. But when we're looking at different languages, there aren't necessarily features that line up. If I have a document and I want to study the frequency of the letter F, well, there are no Fs in Greek. There are no Fs in Chinese, and there are no Fs in um, uh, Arabic. So there's nothing I can do. Similarly, I can ask how often the word the appears, but again, the word the does not appear in Greek or Arabic or Chinese. So I can't use words, I can't use, uh, use characters, but maybe I can use the authorial mind, because your mind is the same regardless of what uh, language you're writing in. Can we identify minds? Well, if you remember, I asked what you could, what I could tell about the author. If even if I can't tell who it is, maybe I can say something about it. And we can identify things like personality type, gender, social class, education, um, deceptive intention. We can even do um, uh, we can even do some work towards um, uh, diagnosing mental illness. So maybe we can find a characteristic of traits that let us identify the mind behind the writing, irrespective of the language. Now, this is a long term research project. I have been working on it for a number of years, and I will continue to work on it for a number of years. But one possibility I'm exploring in this is what I'm calling expressive complexity. Now, I could say that the paradigmatic and systematic utilization of sesquipedalian lexical items can be an informative element of individual and idiosyncratic patterns of the linguistic variation. I could say that, but no one would understand me. But I can say the same thing if I just say some people use big words. What's the difference between the sort of person who writes the first against the sort of person who writes the second? Now, in previous work, which I did with um, uh, with uh, uh, George Mikros, and thank you very much, George, um, we showed that several measures of complexity strongly correlated with each other in samples by English Spanish bilinguals. Uh, that is to say that if people who wrote complex language in English tended to write complex language in Spanish and vice versa. And this happened no matter what definition of complexity we used. But of course, English and Spanish are extremely closely related languages. They use the same alphabet. They both have a lot of Latin words in it. Um, they're, they're both, um, uh, they are both um, uh, Indo-European languages. What happens when you have less closely related languages or even entirely unrelated languages such as English and Arabic? Can I look at how somebody writes English and how somebody writes Arabic? And figure out whether or not the same person wrote these two documents. And I will tell you, I don't know, because it's hard to get the data. Now, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about complexity. Complexity is very ill-defined. There are a lot of ways to measure it. We can talk about vocabulary size. That person who talked about sesquipedalian lexical items obviously has a very large vocabulary. We can talk about mean word length. We can talk about the type token ratio. We can talk about the percent of hapax legomena, which itself is a very complex phrase that basically means words that appear only once in a sample. We can talk about the length of sentences, which is different from the lengths of words. Now, each of these definitions focuses on a different aspect of language, and each language is different in how it handle in how it. Uh, would be expected to measure complexity. For example, Finnish, which is a highly, highly um, uh, inflected language, has a type token ratio of close to one because there are so many different ways to express the same concept, depending on whether you are talking about uh, singular, plural, dual, something that happened yesterday, somebody, something that happened last Thursday, something that usually happens on a Thursday but happens on a Wednesday this week. Um, as opposed to Chinese, where there's almost no inflection at all. But the idea of high should be, still be high relative to other things. 
So our approach is to use a very general method of, of complexity, which is kolmogorov chaitin complexity, which you can estimate by simply taking a sample of language and compressing it. And you look at how long the compressed file is. The idea is a more complicated file will not compress as well, and therefore will be bigger. A simpler file will have a lot more repetition and will compress more. So we can do the compression. I used two different methods, um, uh, gzip and bzip2. And I just calculate the Pearson correlation between samples in English and samples in Arabic to see if complex expressions in one language are tied to compl complexity observed in the second language. I hope that's clear to everyone. Um, if it isn't, somebody will um, uh, hopefully be watching the Q&A and we can sort it out. Our simulated corpus, I say simulated because I can't get access to very many people who write both Arabic and English, not in the, not in the middle of the United States. It's all I can do. To, it's all I can do to find hummus at the um, uh, grocery store. I'm, I live in that part of the world, I'm afraid. Um, so what I did is I took some English data I had lying around from the ad hoc uh, authorship attribution co uh, corpus, and I had it hand translated by a native speaker of Tunisian Arabic. Now, Risa Akroti is a professional translator now living in um, uh, in Italy, and she was able to give me an Arabic version of these essays that were originally in Arabic. And I'm pretending that those are, that those were actually written by the original author in, in Arabic. So then I compressed both the English and the Arabic versions to get the Kolmogor of complexity. So here's just some raw data. Um, so, for example, the first column shows the length of the original source text. The second shows the length of the compressed text when it's compressed in using BZ2. The fourth column shows the length of the Arabic, the translated source text. And the fifth column shows the length of the translated text. Now, a couple of things that I'd like to comment. The correlation between the English zip text, uh, the English zip text using BZ and the English zip text, uh, the Arabic zip text using BZ is extremely high, as is the correlation between the two GZIP versions. When I say extremely high, I mean like 0.97 high. You never see numbers this good with real data. There's also a strong document length effect, though. The red document is the longest. And uh, because it is the longest, it is of the highest complexity, regardless of whether the language is more complex just because there's more stuff said. So we have to do a second experiment controlling for length. I truncated all of the documents at the length of the shortest document. Now, so this means that because they are truncated at that exact length, some of these may be cut off in the middle of a word, and that's not a problem. We just deal with it up to that point. I did the same analysis, and now you will see that all the source texts in English are the same length, all the source texts in Arabic are the same length, and we have these zipped lengths using both methods in both Arabic and English. And again, we see an extremely high correlation between the English and Arabic complexity. A complex expression in one language remains a complex expression in the other language. That is to say, people who write, comple who write complexly in English also write complexly in Arabic. Well, yeah, but these are just translations. But these aren't, and more importantly, these are the same document. They're not just the same author. So, of course, a complicated document will be translated into a complicated document. So I went back and did a matched documents experiment using matched docs from the documents from the AAAC. I used training samples from problem A in addition to the testing document I had looked at. So now I've got three documents by each author. One of them has been translated into Arabic. That's my Arabic source. And then I've got two independent and unrelated English documents that I'm using as my English sources. Hopefully everyone's clear on that. So here's part three of the data. Here's part four of the data. 
And more importantly, the correlations are still incredibly high, even when we get results on paired documents on, instead of on the same documents. So in other words, people who write complicated stuff in English also express them, also have complicated Arabic, given the limitations of the fake translated data that I had to use. So, um, some of the applications of this, multilingual authorship, such as Nabokov, who wrote in French and English and a whole bunch of other stuff, despite the fact that his native language was Russian, or it could be used for generic authorship attribution, where if I have a, an authorship attribution problem in Swahili, I don't have to start from scratch by looking at Swahili documents to figure out if it work, or similarly, generic author profiling. So rather than need to develop a new model for everything, perhaps this will let us provide a simple way of answering the question from a universal tool. Now, the other thing I'd like to talk about is, and this is part of the reason I want to, to be here, I am not an Arabic expert. I would love to talk with Arabic experts, and I look forward to question and answers after the um, uh, well, after the webinar or via email later or any convenient way. But in the meantime, I'd just like to say shakran jazilan lak and ask if there are any questions. Thank you, Dr. Yola. Thank you so much for this uh, very, very interesting presentation. And um, uh, again, I have to uh, ask uh, first um, till some other questions come. Uh, uh, have you ever thought about using machine translation of an English text, text to Arabic text and then test uh, whether there is a correlation uh, in the measure of complexity or any other uh, cross-linguistic uh, authorship attribution measure? Uh, yes, I've actually looked into using machine translation. Um, I was lucky enough to have an opportunity because this um, uh, presentation, uh, because this uh, presentation has been delayed, to get a human translator to do it. Uh, because, and this will come as no surprise to you, but machine translation isn't that good. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to have the best data that I have. Uh, that I could get. There's lots of bad machine translation data that I've got lying around that I could use for uh, similar things. And when I write this up as a journal length paper, I will be looking at some of the machine translated stuff. But I was actually, I wanted to give you guys the best data I had rather than, you know, just putting out second hand. Um, uh, <laughs> but but what, what is your feeling? I mean, uh, machine translation uh, covers the the idolect, the, the style of, of the individual, or uh, it it uh, boosts somehow the individuality. Can you see neutralizing effects or something different? <laughs> I would expect neutralizing effects, just because we would see the uh, we would see some dumb errors that no human would make that would hide the um, uh, that would hide the um, uh, uh, nuances of the idiolect. Uh, having said that, if anyone is interested in pursuing this, um, uh, uh, the actual expert on the style of translated documents is a Pole named Jan Rybitsky, and he has forgotten more about machine translation and stylometry than I will ever learn. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, another thing is uh, actually the, the the core idea between uh, uh, related to the cross linguistic authorship attribution is that idolect is something that uh, survives over the different language codes, and if if we put it to an extent, this actually uh, uh, confirms uh, Chomsky's ideas that uh, we have a, a linguistic acquisition device, a LAD, and actually this device is over and uh, under every uh, linguistic uh, uh, sentence we will ever uh, tell. Uh, so do you think that actually this research confirms this universal approach? I, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, one of the questions is, is there one language acquisition device or are there several, one per language? Or is there a more general learning device of which language acquisition is just part of it? Um, but I think this definitely shows that 
there is a lot of language use that is controlled by the individual mind. I think part of it is just in terms of expressing what you as a person want to say, what you as a person consider important to say, rather than being necessarily part of language, it's part of how you think about communication. So I think this is more about communication than language. Excellent. And the last question from our audience, uh, is it possible that machines could use this to impersonate people? Um, uh, not at this point, but ask me again in five years. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I think we will uh, do that uh, once more uh, this webinar and we will have new answers to these questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Yola, for uh, being with us today. And I really hope uh, we can continue the discussion with our Arab colleagues also, because we need data from them, definitely. Thank you. So uh, our um, next and final speaker is Dr. Daniel Newman. Dr. Newman holds the Chair of Arabic Studies at the University of Durham at UK. And his research and publications have centered on Arabic geographical and travel literature with a special focus on Arab travelers to Europe in the 19th century, as well as the 19th century Arab Renaissance movements in Tunisia and Egypt. In 2009, he was the co-recipient of the World Award of the President of the Republic of Tunisia for Islamic Studies for the book entitled Muslim Women in Law and Society which was published uh, by the well-known uh, publishing house Rutledge in 2007. His works in the field of translation include many, many books, and uh, his research interests also include Arabic linguistics and medieval Islamic medicine and food culture. His most recent book is entitled The Sultan's Feast, a 15th century cookbook, which includes a study edition and translation of an Egyptian, Egyptian culinary treatise. Dr. Newman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, sharing the screen. Right, so thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, very informative listening to the preceding speakers. The topic of the research today is, as the title says, in the angle, the vessel, of course, being a cooking vessel, and involves analysis of recipe ingredients in Arab cookery books from the Middle Ages through a new set of, of methods than these have usually been with. Arab uh, cooking history was, until recently, the best kept secret in food studies. Uh, this is all the more remarkable since it's the richest in the world in terms of the extant resources, which predates the earliest European recipe collections by several centuries. In fact, between the 10th and 13th centuries, Arabic speakers were the only people in the world that were writing cookbooks, as far as we know. A total of 10 cookery manuals are known to have survived, spanning a period of five centuries, from the 10th to the 15th of the Christian era, and represent a geographical area extending from El Andalus, which is how Muslim Spain was known, to Tunisia, Egypt, Baghdad, and Damascus. Another 40 or so are known by their titles only. A number of things are worthy of mention in regards to the culinary writings. Firstly, there's the fact that hardly anything is known about its antecedents. Yes, there is evidence of clear, a clear Persian connection, whereas an earlier Mesopotamian, Babylonian, influence has also been identified. However, the written evidence is that of a fully fledged queen, well established, it would seem, by the 10th century. Of its immediate predecessors, no evidence remains. Chronologically, we have one text that has been situated in the 10th century, five in the 13th, for the golden age of Arab cuisine, one in the 14th, and two in the 15th century. 
when the Arabic culinary tradition comes to a rather abrupt halt and but in a dramatic mat, more aligned with European cooking of the time. When it comes to analysis and periodization, things are not as simple as they appear. For one thing, the oldest dated manuscript of what is believed to be the oldest tech of the late 13th century, 1297 to be precise, over 70 years after the oldest dated text, which is an autograph manuscript from 1226. The issue of authorship, or to be more precise, ownership of the treatise is a highly challenging question. For a start, at least half of the treatises have no or dubious authorship, whereas in many, if not all cases, it is unlikely that one is dealing with a wholly self-contained collection. Rather, for the most part, it is a sample from a historical pool of recipes. What is clear, however, is the esteem in which the culinary art was held in the early Abbasid Empire, uh, which is shown by the fact that among the authors of the books, we find several caliphs, Ibrahim el Mahdi, even the great el Ma'amu, as well as famous scholars from various fields and disciplines, including many doctors, many physicians, writing cookery books. This continued in history, and the British Library, for instance, holds a very ornate copy of a 13th century cookery book, complete with magnificent gold leaf headings, which was commissioned by an Ottoman sultan. Now, who were these authors? It has been suggested that in the beginning, they were essentially nobility, princes, engaging in a princely pursuit or amusement, a distraction for the high-born courtier earning him a reputation for good taste and fine manners. After which it became the preserve of, as one observer called it, obscure scholars, part-time epicures, who wished to preserve for themselves recipes of dishes they had enjoyed, so that they could have their servants prepare them on demand. In short, recipe books for home use. In addition, there were a number of social changes, and in the 15th century, there were fewer venues for opulent banquets than in the golden age of the Abbasid Caliphate. Unfortunately, any interpretation is complicated and oversimplified by the relative dearth of extant manuals. The authors of the extant books include a bookseller, a government scribe, a religious scholar, a poet, and a government official. Some authors refer to having trialed the recipes they write about, but there is no direct evidence that any of the authors, in some cases, have been lived. Relationships between the survivor treated an interesting question, and one which remains to be fully explored, and the current research constitutes a contribution to this particular aspect. The recipes and ingredients reveal, for the most part, a quizzy elite. For this, uh, for the courts and households of the elite, in light of the expensive ingredients that were used to the technical complexity of the preparation, the sophisticated kitchen equipment required, and so on. Finally, it's worth noting that food was also medicine at the time, and many of the books contain some dietetic recommendations, as well as medical preparations. Other elements of experience so are also found in the number. by us and myself constitutes a way of the culinary treatises and goes way beyond it was able to provide an overview of meaningful relationships between the texts as well as the development of taste in the Arabic speaking world between the 10th and 15th centuries. It will also result in a robust tool to link recipes to culinary treatises and will open very exciting new avenues for plotting relationships between the various texts. 
Today we'll be looking at results extracted from a corpus of three cookery books and a total of 530 recipes, 314 from Ibn and 55 from Ibn al Mubarak. When selecting the recipes, it's worth uh, reminding ourselves non food items were excluded. Uh, in the case of Ibn Mubarak Shah, for instance, this resulted in 18 being omitted. Whereas variants in recipe entries were extracted as separate recipes for the purposes of the analysis. As for the authors themselves, so El Baghdadi was a scribe or secretary, as his name indicates. And uh, the book, as he himself affirmed, was written for his own benefit and for those who would like to use it to cook dishes. It doesn't contain any medicinal compounds. The Egyptian Ibn Mubarak Shah was a poet scholar best known for his poetry anthologies. And uh, this is also a recipe collection which he compiled for his own household. As a result, he was one of those obscure scholars and part time epicures that I mentioned earlier. The third text is by a man called Ibn al Mibrat or al Mubarrad, who was a Damascus born legal scholar specializing in Hadith studies, but also known for a number of works in other fields, most notably history. Turning to the results now, this slide shows the number of ingredients in each cookery book, as well as a number of unique ingredients, that is to say, those that occur in only one recipe and as you can see shows considerable variation between the cookery books here we turn to the richness ratio or type token ratio of ingredients across each book and this reveals very clearly a rather unusual finding that is the richness of the smallest cookery book namely the one by ibn al mubarrad which, relatively speaking, uses a wider variety of ingredients and methods, three times more than El Baghdadi, incidentally. This is very significant since one would expect more similarity between the two 15th century manuals. In fact, in this regard, it's the 13th century and 15th century ones that present a very similar picture. even more clearly in this slide, which combines the previous ones. Uh, medieval Arab cuisine was marked by complexity and richness, both in ingredients and in preparation methods. And this is clearly shown in this slide. In some respects, the historical change referred to earlier goes towards explaining discrepancies in numbers between, on the one hand, El Baghdadi, the representative of an earlier golden age, and the two 15th century manuals. But still, in terms of the average number of ingredients, uh, this is, for instance, far higher than those in European manuals that would come along a few centuries later. ingredients and this merits a little bit of uh, attention now this tells us a great about the cuisine and its flavors now the first thing to notice is its meat heaviness which is not surprising because remember it's a cuisine of the elite and meat of course being an ingredient eminently um, connected to the elite cuisine of the time the use of the term meat, however, is not as clear as uh, it appears because there was often no specification as to which kind of meat was used. Chicken is not included, incidentally, in the meat category here. Uh, more often than not, uh, meat isn't defined, but would probably have involved a sheep or some kind of sheep, uh, mutton being the most likely as it was the most expensive. Um, other types of meat that would have been used would have been beef, goat, and camel. Secondly, the similarity in the core ingredients across the books, and therefore a similarity in flavors, with all of them having several sweetness, uh, whether they be cinnamon or cassia, the cheaper variety of cinnamon, 
honey rose water date syrup and this is the dibs that you see in the in the list and so of expensive ingredients in all first these are nuts which were quite expensive and sugar which was actually more precious than honey at the time uh, it was also incidentally praised for its alleged medicinal properties and occurs in many me medical compounds as well it was clearly outside the reach of the poor who would have used the date, date syrup or some other kind of concentrated syrup like rob's in the table you see them you see rub uh, representing rob the expensive sesame oil was used in preference to olive oil at least in the near east as the latter's low smoke point was a clear disadvantage in a cuisine that relied heavily on frying spices were also generally very expensive and the rarer of course the more expensive such as mastic which then as now was only grown in the island of Chios in greece or musk and ambergris it is again Ibn Mubarak's treatise which yields an unexpected result. Its editor, the editor of the manuscript, posited that it reflected the cookery of a certain class of people who ate only vegetables and grain cooked with boiled meat, along with some widespread desserts of the day. The translator of the text concluded that it is merely a modest version of medieval Arab cookery, one which makes relatively sparing use of expensive ingredients such as spices and nuts. However, while it does not contain the more expensive mastic or sesame oil, it does have all the ingredients such as almonds, walnuts, and saffron, which would not have been within the reach of the poor. The next question is to what extent these ingredients were shared among the works in the corpus. The number of ingredients that occur in only one book amounts to 279, whereas 74 are found in two and 47 in three. Remember that the total number of distinct ingredients across the three books equals 568. It also, of course, and this is a very significant finding, it also refers to a certain consistency in the palate across several centuries. figures down a very interesting picture emerges while it's not surprising to find <clears throat> that the highest overlap exists between al baghdad and ibn mubarak shah if only because they are firmly in the elite cuisine while ibn mubarak shah relied on earlier treatises which have much more in common with al baghdad it is uh, surprising that although ibn mubarak shah and uh, Ibn al-Mubarak are from the same period, the same century, there is a significantly higher overlap between al-Baghdadi and Ibn al-Mubarak, which in light of everything that we've said is very surprising indeed. The level of ingredients, the same picture emerges with the top 10 across the pairs being very similar indeed. And this slide here confirms earlier comments about the flavors, which just by looking at the top 10 would enable anyone to imagine what an average dish would have tasted and incidentally also looked like, not least because of the use of saffron, of course, which would have dyed it uh, in a particular color. The following two slides are based on the use of computational stylistics with the recipes, each recipe being used as a text to explore the homogeneity of the cooking books in terms of the ingredients used. So the recipes were analyzed using the same methods as those employed in authorship attribution research. This was followed by the creation of a distance matrix based on ingredient frequencies using cosine distance. This matrix then was subjected to hierarchical cluster analysis and the similar recipes, at least in terms of ingredients, were clustered together. To enhance the robustness of the clustering solution, we used the bootstrap consensus, which results in a large number of snapshots, e.g. for 100, 200, so on, 1,000 most frequent words, and actual groupings tend to reappear. This then allows the capturing of robust patterns across a set of generated snapshots. 
aimed at producing a number of virtual dendrograms and then at evaluating robustness of groupings across these dendrograms and generating a final graph that contains the most stable relations. The headline finding is the 82.1% prediction rate as regards attributing to the individual cookery books. Of the network of uh, recipes shows where, i.e., in which book clusters occur, which then allows an analysis in terms of types of recipes as well as overlaps across the books. It shows, for instance, the increased diversity of Ibn al Mubarad's recipes, and of course, we can also observe a number of very distinct clusters in some of the other books most uh, notably in El Baghdadi. Where do we go from here? Well, actually, this is really but the tip of the iceberg. And the intention and work is already well underway. Um, we intend to expand the corpus to include all of the recipes. So that means of every single extant cookery book. And of course, this will then allow us to provide a very clear picture of the development of the uh, cuisine in the um, Mediterranean across five centuries, but also from one end of the Mediterranean, from the Western Mediterranean to the East. Uh, incidentally, I didn't have time to talk about this, but there are very, very clear differences between the Western and Eastern Arab uh, cuisine, which have yet to be fully explored. And it is exactly this type of research that will allow us to do that. Secondly, a second major line of inquiry that we're, we're pursuing is to use that data and compare it with the data from other culinary traditions. And in the first instance, uh, it would be to compare it to the only remaining text uh, from ancient Rome, which is the Apicius uh, text, which contains about 460 something recipes, and also to include in our corpus a number of early European cookery books, uh, mainly from the 14th and 15th centuries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Newman. Fascinated piece of research, and I think it uh, goes very well with all the other approaches we, we just uh, saw uh, today. And I see Patrick applauding, but uh, yes, indeed, uh, um, computational statistics can be part of uh, of everything i mean you can you can analyze every every text not only the literature text not the forensic uh text but also um uh, recipes and this this gives us um, a quite different approach a quite different view of the things we are uh we can do with uh, with computers and text um a, a small question short question because we are uh uh going to the end of this webinar and i was wondering uh, have you seen uh, some? Uh, uh, can, can, you, can you think some ideas how you can use this kind of research uh, in other uh, in in the kind of intercultural culinary uh, comparison? Can we use the same approaches and comparing intercultural uh, cooking uh, traditions? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think that's probably the most exciting thing about uh, about this methodology. Um, and um, because food is such an integral part of our lives, of, of, of human beings' lives, I think that this kind of research will yield some extremely important findings about a, a whole range of things. At the most basic level, of course, you know, which flavors are most dominant in a, in a particular uh, food culture, but also, and, and most importantly, and this is actually one of the things that I'm particularly interested in and hope to find out through our research, uh, the movement of taste, what I call the movement of taste, 
because I think we all recognize that in the course of our lives even, often tastes have changed. Uh, the things that we used to eat at the age of uh, 20 are no longer the same things that we, we eat today. And so, for instance, in, in uh, countries as people have started to travel more, flavors and tastes that were once otic. And so I think this research will be extremely helpful and, and may actually give rise to a, a new field, which is that of intercultural food studies. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> we just created an allergies, as we say. And another uh, question from uh, our audience, and then we will have to uh, finish the webinar, is um, so the focus goes mainly on ingredients. How about cooking methods or instruments? Do you have any insights on that? Yes, absolutely. I, I think the um, the cook the uh, kitchen implements uh, is perhaps something that um, I think should be looked at in conjunction with archaeological researchers. But when it comes to cooking methods, absolutely. And I think that um, in in our research project, the cooking methods will also be very revealing. Um, and the, the advantage, of course, with uh, the cooking methods is that these can be universal in a way. Uh, you know, we, we all know what frying means, what baking means, what grilling means, and so on. And so that, too, can tell us a lot about the development, not just because I think that is the, the main takeaway from the research and from the project is that it's not just learning about food, it's learning about people's culture and how they view food and how they took their food with them and how food together with the culture spread. And so, of course, for instance, well, one of the things, as, as you know, that is very close to my heart, it for instance, to uh, plot the uh, European cuisine in, in the uh, early modern times. And there are plenty of, of avenues that, that can be explored and will prove that. Thank you, Dr. Newman. That was uh, very, very interesting. Um, may, may, I, uh, may I make yes, a comment? Yes, Dr. Yola, please. Um, uh, very nice work, Dr. Newman. Uh, one of my students and I did a project a couple of years ago analyzing recipes from the New York Times using authorship attribution techniques. And we got largely the same thing when we analyzed the, um, uh, when we analyzed the um, uh, uh, ingredients from the recipes, but we did also analyze the cooking technique section. And we were also able to identify authors based on cooking techniques. Now, this, of course, was studying a particular food columnist's output, not an entire culture's output. But I think you will find very interesting things when you look at the cooking methods. And I'd be happy to discuss this with you more off, uh, more offline. OK, no. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, it's uh, in terms of attribution, I think it, it, it might push our percentage up even higher. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. So um, it's uh, about time to end this uh, webinar. Uh, I want to thank our distinguished uh, speakers for being with us today. I want to thank the audience. Uh, I want to thank the College of Humanities and Social Sciences of the Hamad bin Khalifa University for helping us host this event and organizing uh, this uh, series of webinars. Uh, thank you all so much, and I'm looking forward for the next edition of this series of webinars and uh, research presentations. Thank you again, all. Have a good night. <laughs>